Many of you asked for a video on this topic, so here goes. Cobra Mist was the code name for a joint British and American experimental over the Horizon radar station at Orford Ness in England. Projects like this are usually given code names early on when the details are classified. In recent videos, we've looked at Vullenweber arrays in great detail, with some given the technical name ANFLR 9, ANFRD 10, ANAX 16, and Cobra Mist was no different with its name. ANFPS-95 or System 441A, the name for the wider project. Cobra Mist was part of a small number of Cobra long-range surveillance radars operated by the United States military. Built during the late 1960s and into the 1970s, it was based on the US Naval Research Laboratory's experimental magnetic drum radar equipment, or MADRE, which was able to detect aircraft up to 2,000 nautical miles, or 3,700 kilometers, from its location in Chesapeake Bay. MADRE was even able to detect rocket launches at Cape Canaveral in Florida, 682 miles away, and even more impressively, atomic tests at the Nevada Test Range, 2,173 miles away. The latter detections required advanced setup, but it was proof of a concept and good enough for the US Air Force to start planning an additional site. Originally intended to be located in Turkey in order to give coverage of most of the European Soviet airspace, tenders for a system outlined were placed in 1964 and bids followed the next year for the construction and implementation. Turkey however refused these proposals and the plan was then put in place to move it to the UK. The UK offered a suitable site in Suffolk which offered a view of most of the Soviet airspace and the western edge of the Soviet Union, a compromise but it was something. In 1966 with a location chosen a new series of bids was sent out for a radar system to be constructed and installed. The winner in late 1966 was American company RCA. Construction of the radar started six months later in mid-1967, after some initial testing at the site. A large nine-element Yagi located approximately half a mile to the south of the main Cobra Mist building was erected to supplement the main array. The carefully constructed 118-foot-long, horizontally polarised antenna was mounted 40 feet in the air on two wooden poles. The purpose of the Yagi, other than testing, was to allow comparison with the main radar system, and more specifically its log periodic dipole array, to allow investigations into ionospheric propagation. After testing, the Yagi was removed and disposed of. Later on, a broadband fan dipole was used for similar investigations, and then in attempts to find the noise that plagued the Cobra Mist system in November 1972. The buildings and support systems for the main array had to be carefully shielded to avoid contamination from signals being reflected locally, with many being built on short legs raised above the ground due to the site being below historic maximum water height data. The Cobra Mist array was completed on the 10th of July 1971 and testing began the following week. Tests of the transmitter system included both local measurements as well as tests from distant aircraft. These were completed by September 1971 before engineers moved on to the receive side of the system. A storm in October of that year caused some minor damage which delayed the test phase but nevertheless RCA handed over Cobra Mist to the United States Air Force in February of 1972. The radar employed a very ambitious antenna design based on a fan arrangement of log periodic dipoles. The array consisted of 18 individual strings radiating outwards from a single point. Each string was 2,040 feet long, supported by masts from 42 feet to 195 feet high. These strings were arranged 8 degrees 40 minutes apart, covering an arc from 19.5 to 110.5 degrees clockwise from true north, with multiple active elements hung from these strings. Beneath the antenna was a large wire mesh screen acting as a reflector. The mesh extended past the hub to the east. The following is taken from literature describing the operation which I'll read verbatim. Operating the ANFPS-95 radar took considerable pre-observation setup. 
To select a particular region of the sky, six adjacent antenna strings were connected to the electronics using a switch matrix hidden underground at the antenna hub. Using beam steering, the operators would select a 90 degree wide fan shaped area to investigate. The minimum range was about 500 nautical miles or 930 kilometers due to the maximum elevation of the beams, while the maximum range was about 2000 nautical miles or 3700 kilometers using one hop of the ionosphere's F layer. Ranges between this could be selected by changing the broadcast frequency from 6 to 40 MHz and gated by varying the pulse repetition frequency. Longer ranges were possible under certain conditions by allowing for multi-hop propagation. At high frequencies the active portion would be close to the antenna hub and it would move out towards the larger dipole elements as the frequency was lowered. Cobra Mist wasn't deemed particularly effective from the outset with a gain of around 25 dB. Receiving a useful signal from long ranges required an extremely powerful transmitted signal in order to produce a sufficient echo. The system could produce up to 10 megawatts over 6 to 40 megahertz, similar to that of the Soviet Duga system. However, 600 kilowatts was usually used, and peak power levels of only 3.5 megawatts were ever achieved. Such a small return signal required a receiver sensitivity of 80 to 90 dB to extract the signal out of the noise. The system relied on ultra-linear amplifiers that could amplify the signal across the entire frequency range without introducing distortion. Early 1972 testing by the United States Air Force revealed a considerable amount of unexpected and unidentified noise, which appeared as frequency shifting of the received signal. This made targets appear in all of the filters, which made it impossible to identify their speed. It also led to phantom targets, objects that appeared on radar that didn't actually exist within the indicated area. Targets reported as missiles would automatically be detected wherever the radar was looking. Cobra Mist was in trouble. Extensive investigations into the source of the noise were carried out but to no avail. A desperate US Air Force then turned over testing to a panel headed by SRI International. They continued testing from January to May 1973, but no definitive explanation was ever found as to the source of the interference. Investigations eliminated internal problems with the equipment, and one particularly interesting finding was that the distortion only ever occurred over land. Deliberate electronic countermeasures were never ruled out. Let's not forget that the Soviet Union was also experimenting with over-the-horizon radars in the form of the experimental Duga system around this time. Cold War spies on both sides had infiltrated industry and defence companies extensively, so some form of espionage could have enabled deliberate tampering or interference by the Soviet Union. Along with the fan dipole that I mentioned earlier, other antennas were used as part of the noise investigations. These included a loop antenna, a vertically polarised monopole on the sea wall, and a vertical dipole also on the sea wall. Some experiments were carried out using a helicopter hovering about half a mile from the radar and transmitting a low power signal to be received by the radar using a vertical dipole suspended 300 feet below it. Another experiment was undertaken using an aircraft with a trailing antenna. Although the noise was never identified, the panel at SRI concluded that the system could still be made operational by further improvements in the receivers, although the system would only be slightly improved. Instead, the US Air Force admitted defeat and gave up on the 30th of June 1973, and the system was shut down, never having been used operationally. It's estimated to have cost between 100 and 150 million dollars at the time, which is close to a billion dollars today. After Cobra Mist was shut down, the site and its buildings were occupied by a large radio transmitting station used primarily for the UK Foreign Office and the BBC World Service until 2011. In August 2015, the site and all of the facilities held by its previous operators were acquired by Cobra Mist Limited, a privately owned company. All trace of the Cobra Mist array was removed in 1973. 
Cobra Mist Limited entered into an agreement with Radio Caroline to transmit their services on 648 kHz using the omnidirectional mast. Test transmissions began in November 2017 and full service commenced on the 22nd of December 2017. So that's the story of Cobra Mist, the US Air Force's failed attempt at an over-the-horizon radar.